Tonight, well, I want to start off with a blog entry from redstate.org. This article from redstate.org is called The Eight Inexcusables. Inexcusables, as in bad. <clears throat> Not excusable. And it's right written by a poster called Conservative Majority. And so, you know, I'm thinking, okay, they're going to do their typical liberal bashing here, but that's not the case. It got lost in last week's headlines on Representative Murtha in the Iraq War, the post starts, but the House of Representatives passed a fairly consequential bill, the Deficit Reduction Act, H.R. 4241, to reduce the size and scope of the federal government by a vote of 217 to 215. Now, folks, this would normally be considered good news. Hey, you know, government is doing something to redu be reduced. The Republicans are stepping up to the plate. After years of gorging themselves at the table, while they control Washington, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, and growing the government at a very rapid clip, they have finally done something about the deficit. They have finally done something to rein in big government. Or so we're led to believe. It would save only $49.9 billion over five years, the Post continues. But nonetheless, it was the first attempt to address entitlements since 1997. Important thing to point out here. First attempt to address entitlements since 1997. Republicans have been in control of the House since 1995. They've done nothing to address entitlements. Such programs prove to be extremely difficult to reform because once enacted, the spending automatically flows to all who show up at the government's door meeting eligibility requirements. Well, no duh. I mean, they're called voters, and that's who the Republicans have been trying to appeal to, too. When they went home on their Labor Day holiday, they went home telling people that they were, they were delivering goods to their districts. That was the message they took back. And then they got in some trouble. Tom DeLay said, we can't find anything else to cut. We have a lean government. That's where they got in trouble. Now, the poster, who calls himself conservative majority, is complaining because of moderate bedwetters ended up voting for the bill after changes. The final vote tally is somewhat misleading. Here are the 14 Republicans who maintain their opposition to the end, and he proceeds to list them. Now, I'm not familiar with most of these congressmen, and I, I, I can almost guarantee I'm not fond of most of these congressmen. They're not the least bit libertarian in their approach. They're not looking to downsize D.C. But two names jump out of the on the list. One is Walter Jones of North Carolina's 3rd District, and the other is Ron Paul of Texas, 14th District. As listeners to the show knows, Ron Paul always votes for lesser government. So what was going on? Why would Ron Paul not vote for this bill? Well, we have Mr. Paul's answer. He writes, only in Washington, D.C. can a spending increase be called a spending cut, but that's exactly what happened. Congress passed a budget bill that merely shows the rate at which some federal slows, excuse me, the rate at which some federal spending grows by a tiny percentage, and both parties acted as though a revolution had taken place. Republicans trumpeted the measure as a huge victory for fiscal conservatism, while Democrats were enraged by the supposed slashing of government programs. The uproar ju shows just how entrenched the spending culture has become on Capitol Hill. Even insignificant reductions in the rate of growth in federal spending are seen as earth-shattering. But if we're really serious about cutting federal spending, why not simply cut 10% from the 2006 budget? Good question, Congressman Paul. He goes on. Remember, the same Republicans claiming victory for slowing spending next year also passed the Medicare prescription drug bill, which will add over $50 billion to the federal budget in 2006 alone. Basically, they just, they just got through introducing $49 billion worth of cuts that were not really cuts, they were slowdowns in the increase of spending. So the spending's still going to increase, but they decided to cut it back a little bit, to slow down in their growth just a little bit, by $49 billion, but they already, with Medicare's increase of prescription drugs, wipes that completely out all by itself. Another $50 billion right there. So nobody who voted for the Medicare drug bill has any business talking about government spending. Neither do those who refuse to consider cutting one penny from the military and foreign aid budgets. You cannot conduct a foreign policy based on remaking whole nations using military force and pretend to operate a frugal government. Now, it's interesting because this poster over at redstate.org, who writes this post, the eight inexcusables, begins to take Walter Jones to task. And why does he take Walter Jones to task? Well, Walter Jones complained that there were a lack of cuts to foreign aid programs. That's a bad thing. And then he says this, quote-unquote, conservative is opposed to free trade agreements, opposed to winning the war in Iraq, opposed to tax cuts, which is not true, and now opposed to a very serious spending reduction bill in nearly a decade. They're calling for knocking Walter Jones off because he doesn't support the war, because he didn't support the cast of Boondoggle, and because he wouldn't go along with this phony flim-flam bill that allegedly cut spending. Well, let me wrap up with this, this, this redstate.org, the eight inexcusables, with another response from Congressman Ron Paul. The budget bill fails to address the root of the spending problem. This will lead that Congress must continually create new federal programs and agencies. However, with the federal government's unfunded liabilities, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, projected to reach as much as $50 trillion, that's trillion with a T, folks, by the end of this year, Congress can no longer avoid serious efforts to rein in spending. Instead of a smoke-and-mirrors approach, Congress should begin the journey towards fiscal responsibility by declaring a 10% reduction in real spending. Not just holding back the growth stuff. That's not cuts, folks. I don't care how many times Republicans call You know, Republicans in the old days, I mean, back when I was a kid, used to criticize Democrats for using that kind of language. It's just amazing to me. Followed by renewed commitment to fund only those government functions that are consistent with the Constitution, and by the way, that would cut government by a whole lot more than 10%. <clears throat> well, I know some of you are eager to hear from our next guest, and I am too. Our guest, I, mean, I am too. Lou Rockwell is the publisher, producer, I guess you will, the editor. That's probably the best phrase to give him of LouRockwell.com, his namesake there, LouRockwell.com. 
And the author of the book, Speaking of Liberty, is also involved with the Mises Institute, which is a very well-read economics uh, website, and they're reaching out and, and touching academia. I, Lou Rockwell is just doing some amazing work, and I am really excited to have him joining me on the show tonight. Lou, welcome to the Harry Brown Show. Jim, it's great to be with you. Well, good. I, you know, this is. Uh, not, you're, are you in California? Am I understanding? Yes, I am. Oh, you're getting a little vacation, or no? Just doing some work out here in, okay. uh, with the Center for Libertarian Studies. But I'm, my uh, uh, workload continues wherever I am. Yes, it's, it's very nice out here, of course. And, and I, I reach you by email when I do reach you virtually any time of day. It seems like you are on this, the computer all day long. Yeah, pretty much. You're tied to it, aren't you? Yeah, and people uh, are in fact are always welcome to write me at uh, Lou Rockwell at Mac dot com. Lou Rockwell at Mac dot com. Well, there you heard it, folks. Well, we're getting to hear you tonight. In fact, uh, they said that uh, they have a funny way of putting it on the blog today. They said when they announced your appearance here tonight that uh, you were the Internet star. The radio is going to listen to the Internet star. And I'm, uh, your website is an incredible website. I'd like to give a little background. I'd like to start, if we could, there. Uh, how long ago did LouRockwell.com get started? About um, six years ago. And uh, I thought there was a, um, I thought there was room in a niche market for a libertarian drudge uh, and a more serious drudge. Um, and so far, this seems to have been. This seems, as far as we can tell, and... None of these, none of these independent um, organizations that attempt to serve our readership are uh, the bulk of their problems. But so far as I can tell, it's the best read libertarian website in the world. It certainly appears that way. How many people are reading your page every day? Well, it's about um, hits are about thirty-five thousand a month. I should have, I should have the latest statistics in front of me, and um, which is the, the most inflated way of looking at things. The most conservative, the strictest way is about four hundred thousand unique visitors a month. Four hundred thousand unique visitors per month. Yeah. And you guys also, I get it in my email inbox every day. How many people are subscribing? That's a much smaller number, maybe 22,000. Okay. And uh, anybody is welcome to do it and just uh, have to sign up with no charge. And you get, so that way you don't have to serve. It just comes right to you. Exactly. You get, you, you folks, if you subscribe to the page, it comes in your in mailbox. You get the home page every day in your mailbox. And it's great because, you know, they're, they're, you know, I'm busy doing things with downside. You see, there might be a day or two. I'm sorry to confess this in front of you where I miss reading Lou Rockwell, but I can go back to the email from a day or two ago and easily see what was available that day and, and get caught up. Um, well, so, so you started it from the, about six years ago. Did you start off six days a week at that point? I did, and I, I must say I didn't fully think through the fact that that meant you could never, you know, never take a vacation from it. But um, it, it all began with a, an email list that I had compiled of, I guess, about eight or 900 people uh, who, like me, opposed Clinton's uh, war on Serbia. And um, that, that's really what, what started as, a, as, in effect, an anti-war uh, email list. And then when I started the web page, I emailed those people and, uh, to tell them about it. And that, that was the beginning. And then it's just grown since then. It has, I think that uh, the fact that we focus on war, which Murray Rothbard always said was the worst big government program. You know, sometimes I think I guess it's just sober said that you can tell a conservative these four big government programs if they're killing people. Um, <laughs> although I guess these days they're big government programs, period, uh, the conservatives. Yes, they do appear to be. I don't know if you uh, heard anything that I was talking about in the previous segment, but uh, uh, redstate.org was, getting Ron, was naming Ron Paul one of the uh, eight inexcusables uh, who uh, – had the audacity to vote against this Deficit Reduction Act, H.R. 4241, which allegedly reduced the size and scope of the federal government. This is news to you, right? The, the, the bill or the red state or the... Well, the, the, that the, uh, the bill actually reduced the size... No, of course, of it's all a trick, right? It's, all, <laughs> it's another fraud. It's just another scam. And uh, the Republicans, of course, turn out to be... But the Democrats to shame as big government, uh, big government spenders. They really do. They really do. On the other hand, that probably is more in tune with the actual history of the Republican Party as versus its uh, as versus its rhetoric. Because whether we look at the Lincoln administration or the McKinley administration, Taft, uh, all the, the Republican presidents were all you know for war and and uh, vast subsidies to to uh, corporate pals of the Republican Party, and it really reached its its peak under Herbert Hoover, who, as Rothbard showed began the New Deal. I mean, all Roosevelt really did was continue the rotten uh, interventionist policies that, uh, that, Hoover, that Hoover started. I, I will give Hoover one great piece of credit, however. He was very much a man of peace, uh, very much anti-war, and ironically, he set up his Hoover Institution at Stanford to study war, revolution, and peace to see how we could bring about peace. Uh, ironically, of course, the Hoover Institution is one of the big warmongering organizations um, in the world today, so I guess that uh, happens to a lot of great men, uh, Henry Ford and others who left money for what they, J. Howard Pugh, left money for what they thought were going to be um, libertarian or conservative purposes, and, they get, and the money gets turned against their own ideals. Would you have a good holiday? Very nice. Thank you, yes. Well, good. Now, when we went to the break, I, I you do know, ask... Of course, I'm constantly reminded of this time of year, the fact that you know, Thanksgiving is, of course, a, a, a war propaganda trick of the Lincoln administration, uh, declared by Lincoln and Thanksgiving for the fantastic uh, success of the Union armies in killing so many people, and um, also designed to take people's focus off the fact that, of course, the first Thanksgiving was actually in Virginia, that is, in the South. And to focus everybody on Massachusetts, so everything good is in the North, everything evil is in the South. And of course, even before the, the Anglos in Virginia, we had the, we're looking at European, Europeans, we had, of course, the Spanish long before the English were giving thanks to God. Um, uh, so, anyway, our modern Thanksgiving is, is, it has its aspects of uh, government myth about it. 
That's very, that's interesting. And you know, that's a topic. That's one of the, the various topics that comes up regularly on your page. Kind of a unique uh, facet of your page. You talk about uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War, and and you, you the folks that write for your site have a very different take on that subject. Well, I think people think tend to think that Lincoln was not a good guy. That he was an effective dictator. That he um, launched an aggressive war after. Um, getting the Southerners to, to be uh, dumb enough to fire the first shot at the tax collection office in Fort Sumter uh, in Charleston Harbor. That's what Fort Sumter was, a tax collection office. Uh, nobody was killed. They shot a horse. Um, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't have done it. Uh, in my view, the South should not have tried to secede, even though they had the political right to secede. It was a, uh, they had no chance of, of anything but the disaster that came about. So I think, it was, um, you know, I think that was a mistake. But Lincoln was, you know, was, was a dictator. You only have to look at what he did in the North. Forget what he did in the South. He closed um, thousands of newspapers. Anytime any newspaper expressed any uh, criticism of his policies, uh, it was immediately closed down. He set up military courts all throughout the North where the regular courts were functioning and had people arrested, tried in secret trials, jail uh, in secret for the crime of opposing his policies. You even had, and this sounds like something out of Stalin or Lenin, uh, they were even people who were jailed for the crime of, get this, being present when the policies of Lincoln were criticized and not defending them. Wow. So it was, um, you know, it was, well, there were a lot of people arrested. Uh, they they glory in the fact that was one uh, congressman coming to Landringham from Ohio, Ohio. who uh, was critical of Lincoln. Lincoln um, arrested him uh, and and exiled him <laughs> for criticizing him. Yes, so this, right. is, this is uh, um, you know, I think it's not a good guy. Um, as to slavery, it was of course a crime and a, and a sin. Uh, however, you know we're the only ones who ended it with a war. I mean everybody else ended it peacefully. And um, all of course it never should have taken place. It should have and it should have been ended much sooner than it was ended. But uh, to kill six hundred thousand people and devastate an entire region and and uh, so I think it was, you know, it was not a good thing. On the other hand, it did do what Lincoln and his pals wanted. It abolished the Republic of the Founding Fathers. It erected a new and much more powerful central government. And uh, it brought about much more inflation, much more big government, big business partnership, uh, suppression of civil liberties, the, uh, the temporary abolition of the gold standard. Many of the first, uh, Lincoln established the Department of Agriculture. He established the first income tax. So a lot of very bad stuff. And um, while it's true that the government was smaller after the Civil War, um, by the way, that's a misnomer, too, but the government was smaller after the Civil War, uh, it never went back to the, the pre-war side, and as Robert Higgs has talked about in, in uh, uh, his great books, uh, Crisis and Leviathan, especially, uh, government uh, benefits from crisis. It grows fat on crisis, and while it may shrink back some after a crisis, it never gives up all the power and the money that it sees from the people. So that uh, Lincoln, the, the whole the whole Lincoln regime marked a very very bad, um, a bad uh, a bad step in American history. And I mentioned civil war. You know, civil war is where two sides buy for control of the central government. As in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, the English Civil War in the 17 in the 1600s, um, this was not, this was a war of secession. Um, like the American, you know, the, uh, the American American revolutionaries didn't want to take over London and run England; they just wanted out. So right. Same with the Southern states; they didn't want to take over Washington and run the North; they just wanted out. Um, although I think it was a mistake. I think that, as we saw, as we see in every war, I mean, the same things happened in the South as happened in the North, and every country during the war, the worst people take over. The war that they create, they, a nationalism, a belligerent nationalism. They suppress civil liberties. They had a draft. They had terrible inflation, and um, there were no states' rights in the South during during the war either. I mean, it was the nationalists who took over, and the real states' rights people were marginalized and uh, didn't like what was going on at all. So it, it, um, I think it's a, it's a good lesson that that war is always a problem. Mises talks about the fact that even a just war, justly fought war of defense, you're under attack, you have to do it. This is not a good thing because your own government grows and and uh, takes away your freedom. Even if you're victorious, it's a bad thing. It's so, uh, you don't you know you don't ever want to encourage war, let alone of course do what Mr. Bush has done, or launch a war of aggression against a country that never did anything to us. Um, and I'm reminded as I re read an interesting article today from a Vermont newspaper that um, this is the first charge at Nuremberg, uh, the first war crime, the launching an aggressive war. This was the United States declared a crime against humanity, and I would agree it is a crime against humanity. Too bad George Bush did it. 1-800-259-9231 if you want to ask Lou Rockwell a question. We're going to be touching on a number of interesting topics, not just the Civil War. You know, Lou, when we were headed to the break, you mentioned about Pew, Ford, Hoover, you know, these big institutions that uh, were trying to investigate peace or whatever, kind of being used for internationalists or war or, or other big government purposes. Why do you think that happens? Well, I don't know. It seems to me it's a, it's a, it's a topic of... It's a great topic for a Ph.D. dissertation, for somebody to really look into this. If I, if I know a little bit more about what happened to the Pew Foundation, um, the Pew Trust, um, than I do about some of the others. J. Howard Pew was the um, owner or the, the CEO and owner of much of Sun Oil Company, Sunoco. He was a strong supporter of libertarian ideas, strong supporter of Ludwig von Mises, of the uh, Foundation for Economic Freedom, and uh, Grove City College, and many, many great institutions. Um, the um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Reverend James Fifield in Los Angeles and his wonderful uh, magazine, Faith and Freedom, uh, which, which was um, uh, anti-war and pro-freedom. Um, uh, a wonderful guy in a wonderful magazine that Murray Rothbard and he was a columnist for. Uh, so Pew, a great businessman, great entrepreneur, um, he, was, he, he thought he was saying up things in an ironclad way. He wrote a 
He wrote a long holographic instruction about what his money was to be used for in his, in his own handwriting and what it was not to be used for. And about 10 years after his death, the people he'd entrusted, in effect, tore this up and have just become a very left wing. Lou, you are also uh, affiliated with the Mises Institute, correct? Yes, I had a great honor to uh, be the head of the Institute, and I started it uh, in 1982 um, because I felt that the ideas of Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard and the other Austrian school of economists were not getting the attention they, they ought to have gotten, not only because uh, truth deserves to be told and because these are very great men who uh, we all need role models, we need heroes, we don't just need abstract ideas, but we need heroes who will inculcate these ideas. Um, but I thought that um, I thought there was a need for an organization that was specific to promote the Austrian School of Economics and especially uh, the work of Mises. I, I uh, had the honor of knowing him a little bit and uh, knew his widow very, very well. He served as our chairman uh, uh, for the first 12 years of the Institute. And, um, now, what do you do at the Mises Institute? How do you honor their memory and get the word out about Austrian Well, first I'd like to advise anybody to take a peek at our website, Mises.org, and this is M-I-S-E-S.org, which is the best-read uh, institutional economic site in the world. As far as we can tell, it's all read better than the Federal Reserve, um, even better than the UN. A lot of fun to, to look at some of these, some of the, some of these rankings. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous amount of material on this. There's a daily article you can subscribe to for free. There's a, a vast catalog of, uh, of books and uh, memorabilia that just the people who are interested in the pure free market. Um, there are uh, uh, many books, uh, more than 400 hours of free video and audio, um, thousands of articles, a huge study guide. I mean, it's just a vast resource. And uh, so this is one thing we do. Um, we also hold uh, teaching programs, specifically, uh, most prominently, the Mises University every summer for um, students who come from all over the world to Alabama in the summertime, so you know that it's serious, to study Austrian economics. We have um, two scholarly journals, the Review of Austrian Economics, excuse me, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. Um, originally, it was a Review of Austrian Economics, but then it became a Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. Uh, the Journal of Libertarian Studies. Um, we have um, uh, a book review, the Mises Review. Um, we have a monthly newsletter, the Free Market, which starting, by the way, January is going to be free to anybody who requests it. You can just go on uh, online um, and request it, or you can phone us at one eight hundred of O F Mises, um, and we're, we're glad to add you. This is starting in January to the uh, free market list for free. Go ahead and give out that eight hundred number one more time. One eight hundred of O F Mises, M I S E S. And we have an eight hundred number to give out as well. It's one eight hundred two five nine nine two three one. Get you on the show to ask a little question. We have Bob in Illinois joining us tonight. Welcome to the Harry Brown Show, Bob. Hi, you guys. Uh, Lou, I really enjoy your site, and I wanted to ask you about this recent announcement that the Federal Reserve is no longer going to calculate and publish M3, and also if you could discuss about what causes inflation. I think these are kind of two related items. Well, you know, it's a great question. Of course, there's a lot of obfuscation on what, well, what is inflation. Inflation is an increase in the money supply, and it has many, many bad effects. It, first of all, causes prices to go up. Um, it tends to uh, punish savers and to reward speculators. It tends to punish the poor and the retired, um, and it, worst of all, brings on the business cycle. Recessions and depressions, artificial booms and busts are not uh, a natural product of the free market. They're a result of a central bank like the uh, Federal Reserve. In fact, Ludwig von Mises in 1912, before the Fed was founded, uh, in his great book, Theory of Money and Credit, showed why such an institution would be so damaging to society, uh, not only because our dollar has got, you know, worth about four cents of what it was when the Fed was, was founded, it's, but because of the, this whole uh, series of booms and busts, it also enables the government to fund itself, its wars, its welfare, and all its spy and all the other rotten things it does, uh, in a way that it couldn't get away with it, it had to actually directly tax us or borrow without a printing press. So you think of the Federal Reserve as just the government having a counterfeiting press. They print up the money, and of course it's great for the counterfeit and not so great for the people getting the money, especially those who tend to get it later later in the process when uh, the inflation has taken place. We who have gets far more who, inflation who, today than... Who gets, it, who gets it early and who gets it late? Well, first of all, the government itself and the government contractors. So it's the military industrial complex. You know, Lockheed, Martin Marietta, Halliburton, uh, doctors getting Medicaid payments, and anybody getting dough from the government itself, and people who don't get dough from the government the transfer of wealth that takes place from regular people who are not who are not parasites to the parasites. That's what we can think of the government as a parasite, and the rest of us are the host, except for those people, of course, who, who constitute the government and things like the, the military companies that uh, live off the government and live off taxation. Okay, we'll the public schools, right? I mean, there's uh, many aspects of government in our country. And uh, we'll be getting to another question here in just a moment that came in via email. But when we went to the break, we were uh, dealing with a question that came in from Bob and from Illinois who, uh, who called in. And, and he asked about the publishing of the M3 money supply, Lou. What, what does, first of all, for all the laymen in the audience, what does that mean? And what's the significance of Bob asked of it being pulled off of the Fed's website? Well, it used to be um, years ago, a uh, Federal Reserve statistic, M1, that as much as a federal government statistic could actually tell you anything, told you about the money supply, because of various regulatory changes that take place, there really is no, um, it's, it, it, it's not easy to determine what the federal government is actually doing uh, with, to the dollar. We know they're doing bad stuff, but how fast they're doing it and uh, the exact effects are very difficult to tell. Um, so now they've got many, many different measures of money. Uh, but yes, with, sort of without any uh, notice, they just abolished one of them, M3. And I, I would like to direct people to a, um, uh, an article on my website by Sean Corrigan, uh, S-E-A-N, 
C O R R I G A N. He had a uh, wonderful article on the murder of M3. Just look up Sean Corrigan among the columnists, and it's his most recent article. And um, I think that uh, he thinks that they're attempting to disguise some very bad things that are going to be happening in the uh, in, in the monetary world. And uh, you know whether that's correct or not, it's a counterfeiting press. They are doing illegitimate things, and they don't want to tell you about it. It's a, I, I work once at the honor of working for Ron Paul uh, as his chief of staff in Washington. And if I didn't know this before, this is in the late 1970s, I certainly uh, alerted there that everything they're doing in Washington, they're ripping you off. I mean, somebody is making big bucks off of every single thing they do, no matter what their public excuse is. And that's especially true of the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve is probably the worst thing domestically the government does. And it, um, uh, it's, it's, it's dishonest, it's distortive, it's unconstitutional, it uh, wrecks our prosperity. Um, however, it's very good for the government and government contractors, the banking system itself, uh, they all benefit at the expense of the rest of us. It's a rotten system. And um, if you want to know more about it, there's a wonderful book by Murray Rothbard called The Case Against the Fed. And like all of Murray's stuff, very easy to read. It's a short book. It's on Mises.org. You can read it for free, download it in your computer, or buy it for just five bucks. Um, but if you want to know about what the Federal Reserve does, why it's evil, and why we ought to get rid of it, that's the place to start. Lou, we've got a question to start off this hour. It comes from Bob. This is an email question. But this is the night of the Bobs, apparently. <laughs> I was wondering if Lou was willing to share any civil disobedience, he puts it in quotes, civil disobedience, related items that those of us that are anti-war might pursue. Can we do more than hit the forward button in our email program? What do you say to that, Lou? Well, you know, I, I, this is, of course, seems to be, have to be a personal decision. Uh, very tough to advocate somebody else doing something like this. I, you know, I, I agree with St. Thomas Aquinas that unjust law is no law at all. And uh, so, of course, we have the right to, to disobey an unjust law. Uh, and I think we all agree that virtually every edict that comes out of Washington is unjust. Amen. That's because the only real law is the natural law, and uh, legislative uh, fiat that uh, violate the natural law and not accord with the natural law are, are no law at all. That would include things like uh, murdering people in Iraq. Um, but you know, so there are all kinds of things people do. They, they um, uh, change, you know, they, they they demonstrate what the government doesn't want you to demonstrate. Sometimes they withhold their taxes. All those kinds of things. There's a War Resisters League that's uh, it's a left-wing organization, but it's all without it. Its members, they don't pay, they try not to pay the taxes for the warfare state. Unfortunately, they believe in the welfare state. As libertarians, we know neither one of them is a good thing. Um, you recently, I, I, I you recently addressed... Very, I, don't, I don't feel like I can, um, you know, advocate anybody doing something that potentially puts you in jail. Um, it's a very it's a very tough thing, and my, my guess is, in my own case, I, I don't think we've come to the point where civil disobedience is, is needed yet. Maybe we'll come to that, uh, and maybe that'll be the way that really the, the whole thing ends. I, I remember that um, what really probably had the most to do with ending the Vietnam War was not only the draft resistance that took place here at home, but then they abolished the draft uh, in order to be able to carry the war on. It was the resistance within the military by soldiers uh, engaging in what the government calls mutiny, what I call just, you know, not wanting just to take a day off, or a desertion, as the government calls it, try to change your job, as, as I would think of it. Uh, so you had a whole lot of resistance of civil disobedience within the military, and uh, that scares them. Um, so, you know, maybe we're going to have some of that take place in Iraq. I hear it about uh, these, some of these National Guard guys are being held over there against their will. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but you had, you had a chance to Lou, advocate that for somebody else. Lou, you had a chance recently to address a, uh, an anti-war crowd, a left-wing anti-war crowd. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, it was a United for Peace and Justice rally in Birmingham, Alabama, on the day of the uh, the big rally in Washington. And um, you know, it's a mixed it's a mixed bag, like the, the, the one in Washington. I might add, like you know, the conservative movement's a mixed bag too. Mm -hmm. So they they they're very good on the war, and uh, they're very good on civil liberties. They're very good on um, uh, government spying on us and those kinds of questions. On the other hand, they you know, want to have the government take all our money to erect a welfare state and, uh, in, some, in some cases, a socialist state. Some of them go along with Noam Chomsky, who calls himself a libertarian socialist. Of course, that, that's a, that's a contradiction. Oxymoron, term. Yeah. But, um, so, but, you know, I always think if people agree with us on something, I think you should try to work with them if it's an important topic. Was your speech uh, well received? It was very well received. And um, uh, there were a group of uh, young libertarians there uh, from Auburn University who went up with me and had all kinds of great signs like, um, uh, make money, not war. <laughs> and and uh, they got a lot, you know, got, got into a lot of discussions. And and um, one of the kids uh, uh, had a pro-capitalist sign and was attacked, I mean, totally attacked by a left one guy. And the and the uh, libertarian student said, "Well, what do you, what, what does capitalism mean to you?" He said, "Well, it's the government, you know, going all over the world and forcing other countries to have special deals with the big American corporations." And and the guy said, "Well, that's not capitalism. That's you know, that's some kind of fascism or interventionism or whatever." And it's not what we believe in. We believe in a free market. And, I don't know. It's a, I think these 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 sorts of dialogues. Are wonderful, and I think again the war is, is and the warfare state and all the things that go along with it. The excuses for shutting us up, for uh, putting people in camps, for more secret police, for spying on us, reading our emails, uh, knocking on the door in the middle of the night, and sending you to Guantanamo, and all the, the things they claim the right to do to us. This is the most important issue. And so, if we can get people, even if they never agree with us on other things, to cooperate uh, in, a, in a common cause against the warfare state, I think it's great. Now, you also had a fantastic column here recently called "The State and the Flood." On my radio show, I, I really. I, I shared a great deal of the column, and I really extolled the virtue of it over a couple of different weeks uh, after what happened down in New Orleans. Uh, what happened exactly in New Orleans? Whose fault was it? Was it the hurricane? What was it? 
Well, of course, we have, you know, we have um, terrible natural events that take place. But to me, it was no coincidence that there was a government flood wall that broke, and and um, the government had planned the whole place and and uh, set up its alleged anti-flood strategy at vast expense. Does all then all kinds of things to the Corps of Engineers, an entirely illegitimate organization operating here domestically anyway, um, to uh, destroy the natural marshes and do all kinds of things that made a f- uh, flood uh, um, much more da- damaging. And uh, so, if, uh, you know, people can look at that look up that column on the website. But basically, um, I think not only in its alleged planning against the flood, did the government make everything worse. But then, especially after the flood, of course, it, as I think we all saw, it was quite a wonderful development. I saw even reporters, normally so sycophantic, every government official, giving government officials a tough time. It was a great, great thing to see. Uh, we really saw the total incompetence and and um, uh, evil of the federal government, and why it, you know, why it only makes trouble and can only transfer wealth. Every single thing they do, they're taking money from some people and giving it to others, and mainly to themselves, of course, but also to plenty of people who uh, are the contractors. And uh, not for the benefit of the American people, certainly not for the benefit of our freedom uh, or our prosperity, just the, just the opposite. Yeah, you know, I think it's great that you saw those reporters, because the night of this, that Bush gave that speech, you know, Timmy Russell was jumping up and down like a schoolboy, all excited. It's going to be like FDR and New Deal all over again. We're going to have the first city of the 21st century. I mean, it seemed like the whole media that night that I saw was, was you know, embracing this New Deal idea. They, they liked this idea of a new New Deal. Sure, it's true. We think of, you know, I mean, the conservatives talk about liberal bias, and liberals talk about conservative bias in the media. Not that one of those is the problem. The problem is state bias. The media is joined at the hip with the central state, and they promote the central state, and they promote all its various evil activities. And so the media are, by and large, uh, a very big problem for any of us concerned with the freedom. Uh, Lou, you and uh, Harry Brown go back a ways, uh, as I understand it. You guys knew each other a long time ago. How did you meet Harry Brown? Well, I, I, met, I was very lucky to meet Harry Brown um, in the late 1960s when I was working at a publisher called Arlington House, which was the only publishing house at that time that would normally publish uh, libertarian or conservative books. And I remember getting his, the manuscript of his book, How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation. And uh, I started, I was an editor there, and I started to read it, and I thought, holy smokes, what a great book. And um, it went on to become Arlington House's only New York Times bestseller list, uh, bestseller, and uh, made Harry famous, or more famous than he had been. And uh, he was also a tremendous promoter of his book. Uh, but it was uh, such a beautifully written book, I still think his description of inflation and uh, what the Federal Reserve does and basic monetary economics is the clearest, best, short layman's um, uh, writing on this that I've ever seen. I mean, Harry's a very, very talented guy, and I uh, you know, was his editor. And um, when the book was published, and, and I've known him ever since then, and admired him, and admired the uh, well, not one, much of one for uh, people who run for office, with the exception of Ron Paul, but Harry Brown's an exception too. He, uh, um, I, you know, I think the world. Went. He was a special candidate. I was able to be his press secretary in 2000, and you know, you just you see the guy. You know, the, I'm not trying to cut anybody here, but the guys before and since, and he just you know is kind of head and shoulders above them. He just really has that ability to communicate. And I've learned so much from him. I'm privileged to be able to sit here in his seat tonight. One eight hundred two five nine nine two three one. If you want to get on the show, or you can email us at comments at downsizedc.org. I want to. Ask a question about the courts and the Fourteenth Amendment. I got a question here about Social Security. I got a question here about Murray Rothbard. I don't know if we're going to get to any of that stuff, but I got to ask about. Well, that's quite sure. I got to ask about regime libertarians. Uh, your site's very much in the. Uh, this article, the regime libertarian, struck me as being very much in the old Murray Rothbard tradition. Uh, this was about the Libertarian Party's exit strategy from Iraq. What did you think of the LP's exit strategy? Well, I, I don't want to think about only the LP, but I think there are uh, people who. Um, let's just say, if, if you if you set out to, if your main goal in life is to, is to persuade the government of a different course. Um, but then, of course, you can't ever say anything that's going to really bug the government. Uh, you've got to just be, you know, very careful, very incremental, and just, um, uh, and in fact, I don't, I, uh, this is the whole, this would be a subject of the whole other show. I don't think it's any coincidence that, that libertarians who set out to do that end up actually advocating bigger government, whether through so-called social security privatization, whether through school vouchers, or whether through this terrible uh, so-called exit plan of the Libertarian Party, which was advocating massive foreign aid for Iraq, uh, and keeping all the troops over there, just getting them out very, very gradually out of Iraq itself, but keeping them there on the borders, I guess, ready to kill and bomb again if uh, they didn't uh, do the will of Uncle Sam. Um, but just, you know, how naive this foreign aid is an act of imperialism. It's not a charitable act. The government, this massive op- this massive uh, conglomeration of uh, people we can think of as a, as a band of thieves writ large, they do not engage in charity. When they give so-called foreign aid, first of all, it benefits big corporations friendly to the government here at home, but it's used to extend the power of the U.S. government in, let's say, a post-war Iraq. Um, so anyway, the, the whole exit plan was something that pretended to be a more moderate um, anti-war thing and actually turned out to be worse, I mean, worse than some of the Republican stuff. So I thought it, um, again, people could take a look at the article. If they want to just put regime libertarian, and you just put it in Google, and it'll take you right to that article. Now we have a question from, that came in on the comments at downsidesdc.org email here. Uh, Alan in California writes, <clears throat> Most people believe that national defense is too overwhelming a task for the free market and that only a state is capable of providing it. What are some free market alternatives for national defense? Well, you know, there's a very uh, wonderful book edited by Hans Hermann Hoppe on um, national defense and, and the market. But, you know, has anybody ever been in the Army listening here? I mean, the, the government, um, the idea is the state can provide this most important service and do it well, 
Uh, it's true that the late Peter Drucker, the late Peter Drucker said the government could only do two things well, make war and um, uh, steal our money through taxation. But, you know, so there, I guess they have a, an ability to kill people uh, en masse, but is that national defense? I, you know, I don't think so. And I think that um, even if we're going to have a government um, defense in the sense, you know, we have to go back and see what the founding fathers said. We don't want standing armies for the federal government. That's very, very dangerous. And as Madison said, brings about this is the worst threat of liberty is government militaries. So, you know, we can look at the way Switzerland does it. We can look at the way America used to do it with militias, state militias, and, and uh, there are all kinds of alternatives. But the present system is uh, the worst threat to liberty in our country. I mean, it's being used right now to, to um, attack our liberties in a whole host of ways. And uh, rather than protecting us, you know, I think we have a very tough thing for Americans to, to think about this, that uh, our worst enemy is not, you know, some bird in a cave in, a, in Pakistan. The organization that is attempted is taking half our money, who wants to run our lives, wants to raise our children, wants to run our families, our businesses, tell us how to live in our neighborhoods, wants to run every aspect of our lives, know every dime that you have and what you do with it, control everything you do, is in Washington, D.C. That's where the real threat is. So uh, the idea that you want to give them power to uh, have these massive armies and fleets and atomic bombs and um, excuse me, that's in, in, you know, inconsistent with liberty. The great the French uh, libertarian, Belgian libertarian, um, de Molinari, Gustave de Molinari, first to write about this in um, more than 100 and, and um, 30 years ago, um, Murray Rothbard wrote about it. Hoppe, um, you know, if the free market can do everything else, why can't it do this? Um, so, I, you know, I think that the idea that government has to provide this, it doesn't work. In fact, it doesn't provide it. Look at American wars. Virtually every American war involves, you know, attacking somebody else. It doesn't, it doesn't involve defending us. Right. So it's just a fraud. We a got fraud a, for murder and for theft. We've got about 25 seconds here in this, in this segment. Social Security reform. Your site has definitely spoken out on this issue as well. What's your position on Social Security reform? Well, for anything that, you know, yeah, that uh, lessens it. Anything that would cut taxes, anything that would allow people to opt out, anything that would shrink the the the, uh, the terrible carbuncle of social security in our society, which is economically very damaging. But the idea that we should have massive, you know, forced savings programs to allow the government to own stocks allegedly for our benefit, you know, this is a this makes things much much worse. So we don't want what Bush was advocating, so-called social security privatization, which would make things worse. We want to look at things that would cut back, allow people, let's say, to say. You know what? I, I agree to get no social security payments in return for not paying any more taxes. This was, some of this was done under Margaret Thatcher in Britain. It can be done. We need to cut social security, cut its reach, cut its power, not expand it in the name of libertarian rhetoric. I, I'm going to have to make some choices here, Lou. I got a, I've got four or five more questions I want to ask you, but I'm, I know we're going to have to limit it here. Uh, well, I'll try to keep my answer short. I'll okay. For, no, that's great. I mean, these, you, you are obviously well read and, and understand a diverse number of subjects, and, and I'm just kind of amazed. I, I, one of the questions I want to ask you had to do with where you got your writers from. I mean, there's you have a large uh, wealth of writers. I'm particularly these days fond of Butler Schaefer. Every time he writes something, I'm sure to click in, on it and read it. Where do you get these guys from? Well, I guess I could take them from the spontaneous order. I mean, some of them I've asked to write. Others have written me and asked to write. Uh, Butler Schaefer, of course, has been an extraordinary libertarian, intellectual, and advocate of freedom for many years before Lou Rockwell.com. He's a professor of law at Southwestern Law School in, in uh, Los Angeles, author of a, a number of very important books. And uh, I just think he's an extraordinary, extraordinary guy. Very, very smart, very effective. And uh, I'd urge everybody to click on his name when they see it. Yeah, I, I just I, I don't miss a column by him. I know there's you know there's, there's a lot of columns every day, folks. You get a, a good dose of it. There's about you know what eight, ten, sometimes a little bit more. Right, Lou? That you well, are twelve articles every day. Okay. Most of them originals um, and uh, a few links. It okay. can vary, but that's the general. So there's a good steady diet of good material there. You don't have to read the the, 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 the propaganda of the state. You can get some uh, different insight on the world there. And uh, Butler Schaefer is absolutely wonderful. It kind of gives a, a philosophical or even a spiritual, without being religious, type of perspective on, on, on the damage that the government does to the individuals, on their spirit, on their wills, and, and, and uh, their abilities. Things that kind of are hard to quantify in, uh, in typical economics models. But uh, the, the insights that he offers are just absolutely wonderful. Murray Rothbard. Well, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people could read from Murray Rothbard. He's a very prolific writer, but you knew him. He was a friend of yours. What would you want people to know about Murray Rothbard? What's one good Murray Rothbard story? Well, as you can tell from his archives, which we are very lucky to have at the Jesus Institute, um, from the time he was in grammar school, he was recognizably Murray Rothbard. And when you read his papers as a, as a child, um, that passion for liberty and uh, that um, searing intellect and that ability to look clear-eyed through the fog of government and maybe things that parents or others are teaching us, or uh, in his case, his dad was a great libertarian, so not in his case, but uh, teachers in schools or whatever, to see through the truth. I mean, he, he was, he, his entire life was spent in the cause of liberty, but with huge joy. I mean, this was a man whose presence you couldn't be in for more than two or three minutes before you're laughing uproariously. I mean, he was so funny and um, uh, so productive. Many, many books, thousands of articles. Uh, if you look on um, Jesus.org, or I have it on uh, LewRockwell.com, too, his annotated bibliography, which we, we still don't think is quite finished. We think there's still something out that we don't have on it. Um, but he just wrote a huge amount, plus he was teaching, plus he had many, many hobbies, a great circle of friends, and a salon in his apartment in New York of libertarian intellectuals. Um, he, was, uh, he was really the creator of the modern libertarian movement and of libertarianism as a, as a set of ideas. Um, uh, really, he is the manager of Austrian economics. 
uh, individual of anarchism of the 19th century, natural rights theory, Thomism, Aristotelianism, and combine them all into uh, such a powerful uh, package as you can't, um, if you if you if you read just a little bit of Rothbard, you never really see anything else the same again. You see through what the government is doing, you see through what the media is doing. Um, I just I can't um, uh, advocate too strongly that people take a look at his writing, uh, whether it's his journalistic writing, his very very serious economic writing, because he was a very important Austrian economist, Mises' most important student, um, a very important political philosopher, um, a very important uh, libertarian activist. Uh, just uh, really, I, I just what an extraordinary man he was. But if I would leave it, you know, besides this, who knows what his IQ was? I don't know, 250 or something? But, <laughs> but, but um, besides that, just a great guy, very, very funny, not an arrogant phone in his body, um, somebody you'd love to have a drink with, as well as be in his class. And he would have really dug the Internet, wouldn't he? Oh, he would really, he was not exactly Mr. High Tech, but he, um, he would have loved the Internet, and, and I would say he's a bigger figure today in the world of ideas than he's ever been, and that's because of the Internet. So you can all of a sudden read uh, what he wrote, and we have uh, um, all the various articles, we're putting them up as many as we can on the website, many of his books on the website, and um, the author of the great uh, treatise, uh, Man, Economy, and State, um, thousand-page economic treatise, and many great short journalistic articles, some of which I collected in, uh, in a book, and, and uh, everything in between. I mean, he was, you know, how did he do it? Very, very hard work, total dedication, total dedication to the cause. When you look through the letters, and what an extraordinary experience it is to look through these letters. Um, someday we're going to collect them into maybe 12 or 14 volumes of these letters. Um, so interesting, so um, apt, so so sharp, so you learn so much from them about not only the current state of affairs then, but the future and about the, how to look at things. So all that, but combined with one of joy. I mean, just a, he once wrote a wonderful article about H.L. Mencken. He dubbed him the joyous libertarian. Well, um, that was certainly Murray Rothbard. He was um, just what a guy. Lou, final question at downsizedc.org, my organization. We are uh, asking something, requesting something novel. We are uh, advancing the idea that there ought to be a law passed called the Read the Bills Act that actually requires Congress to read the laws it passes, uh, which we believe would slow down the speed at which they're working in Washington, D.C. Is it too much to ask Congress to read the laws before they pass them? Well, it's not, but of course it's actually impossible in the present context because they pass thousands and thousands of pages of laws. So that, you know, Ron Paul famously talks about the Patriot Act, which was this huge multi-hundred page bill, very complex, delivered to them an hour before they were supposed to vote on it. Yes, this kind of the bill was in there, right? And this is all intentional. So no, they don't read anything. No congressman reads any bill. And uh, Ron Paul has a very correct view that uh, if you don't know what's, if you're not 100% sure of what's in it, you're going to vote no. So that's the way they should all be, and I think it's a great rhetorical thing. But you know, to get to a, I imagine they read the bills in the, uh, you know, the first Congress, and maybe they read the bills under Jefferson or whatever. But as government, you make a great point because as government gets bigger and bigger, um, it's a, a bunch of staffers and outside uh, special interests and and uh, people in the permanent bureaucrats in the executive branch who are actually writing these bills, reading them, who know what's in there. But no, the typical congressman doesn't know. He doesn't know anything. Well, Lou, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the Harry Brown Show. I know Harry would have been, will be pleased to hear this as well. Well, Harry's a great man, and it's, it's an honor to be on the show, Jim, and great to be with you, too. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. I, I was really thrilled to have Lou Rockwell on the show tonight uh, to be able to uh, talk to him. I had never spoken to Lou before. I've emailed with him uh, scores of times, uh, shared ideas with him, and uh, I read his page on a regular basis. I cannot recommend highly enough LouRockwell.com. It is probably the biggest deal on the web in the libertarian movement at this point in time, and, and, and it, uh, it provides a, an education. It provides a staple. You know, as you're going through your day and you're encountering the bias of the media, and, and you see, and the bias, as he pointed out correctly, is a bias that's pro-state. It's a bias that is designed to make you think that government programs are the solution to every uh, every problem imaginable. And, and, and constantly there is a uh, there is a, a bias on the media's part. They're constantly looking for ways to expand the government. It seems uh, when the war was was being uh, sold to the American people, when an attack on Iraq was was the approach that was being offered by the Bush administration, there were very few dissenting voices because they were giddy with excitement with the opportunity to have embedded reporters. They follow the president around every day. They follow various cabinet leaders around all day. They follow congressional leaders around all day, and they report on what these people do and, and as if this is all life is about. And uh, you have to have a, 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 an antidote to that. You have to be able to build up your immunity and be able to think straight. And the people that write, by and large, for LouRockwell.com, uh, write, by and large, uh, articles that uh, will help you think correctly. They will give you, a, a, if you are not maybe a libertarian yet, they will give you uh, an insight that you wouldn't have had before. They will, they will ask you a question. And these questions you know, are, are power, based on powerful ideas that once they get in your head, they kind of begin to clang around a little bit, and they begin to change some things around. They begin to make you see things differently, see the whole world differently, see the claims of the administration and, and other people in government in a very different way. And uh, I, know I mentioned Butler Schaefer, but there's all kinds of guys that are writing from this page. James Ostrowski, Joe Sobran, uh, Charlie Reese, uh, Lou Rockwell himself is writing some great stuff. Uh, uh, Stephen Carson. Uh, there's just you know so many different people writing for this page right now. James Wilson, another one of my favorite writers over there. James Leroy Wilson. You know there's there's some really good material that's being put up at the LouRockwell.com page, and you have an opportunity. Jim Cox. I mean it just goes on and on. Harry Brown. Uh, you can go and read these columns and, and get insight on what's going on in the current news. And in the Mises Institute, 
you know, we didn't really get a chance to do this justice. And you know, anytime you're in a, uh, an interview like this, you, you always wish you had more time to talk and you could elaborate more. And, and, uh, and, and as you can tell, Lou has a breadth of experience and, and ideas and concepts in a lot of different areas. And he was able to very easily share those ideas. He just came out of him. But the Mises.org, you know, Lou's not involved in, only in just one valuable thing, but he's doing two valuable things. And, and Mises is, is, is basically training the economics department leaders of tomorrow. And so I encourage you to check out Mises.org. I have to be honest with you, I have a little, more hard, a little bit more hard time with this page because I really wasn't well educated when it comes to economics, and I'm learning more all the time. And, and as I begin to understand things, I'm getting better and better at it. But this is a page that's really targeted at people who take economics and the study of economics as, as an art or a science very seriously. And uh, it, it, it's waging, uh, it's, it's participating in the war of ideas. It's also, as I said, equipping this next generation. Lou talked about the students who come in the summertime to participate in their courses. Uh, it's an opportunity for them to be prepared and equipped and, and basically to begin placing free market thinkers in academia all across the country. Both of these functions in, uh, that he's engaged in, Lou Rockwell back and you can visit Mises, M-I-S-E-S, dot org, uh, are doing a very valuable service for our country, and I encourage you to check them both out. Well, I was glad that uh, Lou uh, had some, some positive things to say about the Read the Bill Act. Read the Bills Act is, is beginning to pick up steam. We're going to be uh, giving some more good news about the Read the Bills Act this week at DownsizeDC.org. You can go to DownsizeDC.org. The great thing about our system is that we are actually acti activating people, and we're changing the dynamics. You know, government programs uh, grow because a very small handful of people benefit from the growth of that, and they work hard to get that growth. But the costs are dispersed over a wide, wide array of people. And so people aren't going to go march on Washington to save a nickel, a dime, a quarter, or a dollar. Uh, you know, they're not going to do that. But we've been able to turn that around. We've been able to focus on a very small amount of people, Congress, 535, that cannot close their portals. And we've given a unique lobbying mechanism. We call it the electronic lobbying system, where you can come to downsizedc.org, you can fill in your information, and it will tell you who your representative and two senators are, and allow you to send a custom message to, to uh, all of them uh, on, on various issues. We've taken on the Patriot Act. We've taken on uh, some of Ron Paul's bills. We've done. We, we've backed a whole bunch of different things. If you go to DunsizeDC.org, you can see those campaigns. And the Read the Bills Act is a center campaign. And we have just now, just this past week, started a brand new blog. We've got a blog button on the left-hand side of the screen, and we're telling good news because we just couldn't contain all the good news, frankly, in our Downsizer Dispatch email messages. First of all, as I was saying before the break, we have a new blog at uh, DownsizeDC.org, and I encourage you to check it out. We'll be updating this on a regular basis. My favorite posting, though, from this past week is to ask the question, is imitation the most sincere form of flattery? You know, the Cato Institute is the big boy in the libertarian movement financially uh, and institutionally. They have a very large, about a $17 million budget, and they employ about 150 uh, po people, mainly, mainly policy experts. And uh, uh, they're quoted around town and they're seen in the media, and uh, they have picked up on the downsizing idea. They have, uh, uh, they have uh, released a new book called Downsizing Government by Chris Edwards based on a study that he did last year called Downsizing the Federal Government, and it was introduced by a symposium impro appropriately correct uh, called Downsizing Government. Now, even though they're using the downsize DC, downsizing line, uh, very similar to Downsize DC, you know, uh, they, they have not sent me a copy of the book. I'd love to see a copy of this book, and uh, so if anybody you know, has any friends at Cato and would get them to pop a, a copy of this book over to me, that would be great. But I am just thrilled to death that they're picking up on this. I think the downsizing idea is going to take everybody by storm. Uh, we do need to downsize DC. I'm glad the show's coming near an end here because my voice is really wearing out. But uh, I want to get one more thing in. And that is the tenet there is a, a there was a tentative deal on the Patriot Act extension, and it had some new provisions in it. They were extending some uh, uh, they were extending provisions that uh, were uh, were set to sunset in a few years, as well as provisions that were going to sunset here in December. And that deal fell apart right before the, new, the Thanksgiving break. They were not able to get it done, and they, you can bet your bottom dollar they're going to do whatever they can to get this done because some of the provisions of the Patriot Act do sunset and expire in December. So Congress is going to be doing all they can. And the Democrats smell blood in the water. They see the president's low poll numbers and his lack of popularity and his poor handling on a variety of issues, and so they are doing everything they can as coming into this 2006 election year, believing in their heart of hearts that they actually have a chance to take over the House, and so they may be willing to fight. We're hoping that gridlock becomes the rule of the day on the Patriot Act, and you can go to DownsizeDC.org. The Patriot Act campaign is right there on the homepage. Just scroll down a little ways and tell Congress that you want gridlock. You don't want a vote on the Patriot Act. You want to let these provisions expire ex and, and, and go away. And you have the opportunity to do that. This is something that we could potentially win. Now, I think the Democrats are going to capitulate at the last minute. That's what I fully expect. But we've got to give this a try. We re that there really does seem to be a chance in this case. Again, that's DownsizeDC.org.